Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Happy New Year. Uh, This is going to be one of those uh, tax episodes, which is critically important and also just as important to keep it short, concise, punchy, get you what you need to know, and then get you back into your new year. So with me is my friend Evgeny Ivanov, who is our, uh, yeah, the, our perennial expert we bring around whenever we have our tough tax questions we want to talk about. Evgeny, welcome to the show. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having me again. I'm glad that you agree that Die Hard is a Christmas movie, so now you're definitely going to come back or else it's dicey what would have happened otherwise. <laughs> um, so we're just going to today talk about a, a few uh, sort of bullet points, some things to think about for this tax year, some adjustments that are happening with the tax code and position our tax paying listeners, which hopefully is all of you. <laughs> um for the year that lies ahead. The first thing, every year there are inflation adjustments for uh, each of the limits on, you know, there's the all the tax brackets get an inflation adjustment and all the contribution limits for the different plan um, contribution thresholds. So for anything that's automated with your paycheck, one of the things as you're thinking about 2024 taxes, what should I be doing? You wanna look at your employer contribution Um, employer retirement plan contributions with your HR, with your payroll, if you have a log in there to make sure, especially if you're maximizing that the amount that you put in last year um, is appropriately boosted. So 2024, the max you can do is $24,000 into your 401k, 403b, thrift savings plan, or similar for the catch up. If you're age 50 or over, it's 30,500. So you want to make sure in the next couple weeks, get in, update that, and you'll be good to go for the rest of the year. There's a couple other account types, individual 401k, your HSA, and then your Roth IRA. Each of those are getting a little uh, inflation jump as well. And don't forget for that individual 401k, there's the two parts of it. There's the employee contribution, which as we just said is $24,000. There's also the employer contribution, which if you have some self-employment income, some 1099, you're doing locums, you have consulting, something like that, or you're a practice owner. You have the ability to do both in a 401k, the employee and the employer. The sum of those in 2024 is $69,000. That number, 69 grand, is also known as the Section 415 limit. So you can impress your CPA whenever you're talking about your tax return for last year and say, hey, CPA, are we funding this solo 401k to the 415 limit this year? And what's it going to take, you know, to do that next year? That'll be something to think about. Um, in addition, this is January. Tax deadline is April 15th. We've got the extension deadlines later this year. But for your HSA specifically, you have an opportunity to fund up to the max before the tax deadline. So if you want to max out your HSA, then you can write a check directly to that HSA before April 15th to make sure that you get the pre-tax deduction to which you uh, are entitled Number two on our list, things to think about for the 2024 tax year. Evgeny, you want to introduce this one? Yeah, number two on our list is the electric vehicle credit <laughs> that the government gives to anybody who purchases electric vehicles and certain plug-in hybrids. There's a list we can find online about the uh, vehicles and the hybrids who qualifies uh, which vehicle doesn't. And there's been a, a changes the last few years. And I'm sure that dealerships, when they sell your vehicle, will know all that, but it doesn't hurt to confirm, ask them about details, and especially if you're buying them used from a direct owner, not from a dealership, look look, look up the rules. I know for 2023, there is a cutoff, I, April, I believe, 17. There were different rules before and after. There is limits on the purchase price, if it's a new vehicle, if it's a used vehicle. Uh, we're not going to give you the numbers right now. They're easily uh, researchable online. You can just Google and they'll pop up. There's uh, limits based on uh, 
kilowatt on the battery before April 17th. So there's various rules. The bottom line is after April 17th, the credit is up to 7,500. You can get it up to 4,000 for a used vehicle. And there's also a limit on, on your income. Uh, if you bank above a certain amount of money, you will not be able to take the credit. And also the credit is non-refundable, which means if you don't owe any tax for various reasons, you will not be able to take a refund of that, that credit. Now, there is a change that's coming in 24 which will benefit people that make above the, the limit. There is, a, and I don't know if the rules are clear yet, all the rules, but there will be an option to take it out of your purchase price when you buy the vehicle from the, uh, at the dealership. And keep an eye on that. Talk to your uh, salesperson when you purchase a new electric vehicle and see if that's an option, if it's something that they can offer. If you make above the threshold, and that's an option. Uh, that's your that's your best bet to take advantage of these credits. And essentially, and, in that case, what what I've seen is that you're you're signing over the tax credit to the dealer, and and they're going to give you a commensurate reduction in purchase price. Is that is that right? I don't know the logistics of it, but I know. I mean, all I let's say if I go buy a new vehicle, all I care is like, hey, the vehicle is sixty thousand dollars. You can take the credit, take out the seventy five hundred off my price, and I'll pay you the rest, and that's it. I don't know how at that point they'll calculate the you know the sales taxes and all these other fees, but I'm not, I'm sure they'll figure it out. The dealerships, yeah. Uh, we'll also link to some specifics if you go to the show notes apmsuccess.com slash two two six for episode two hundred twenty six. Uh, we'll. Uh... There's plenty of good resources there and tables and charts to consult on kilowatt hours and different price thresholds and gross vehicle weight and income and all that stuff. Um, you may also think about if you want to take advantage of the EV purchase for tax deduction reasons, we'll throw a little uh, note in the show notes. Evgeny and I have talked about this in the past. It actually might have been last December. Um the deductibility of a vehicle for business use or especially for locums physicians, or if you're a practice owner, you're a business decision maker, you have the ability to uh, deduct you know, some or all of your vehicle depending on use. You're going to want to make sure that you're uh, yeah, dialed in there and on the same page with your CPA. You're going to have to ask your CPA to sign that tax return and you got to make sure that uh, everything is copacetic there. If any, do you have people who want you to sign tax returns and you're like, this is not happening, this is not a good idea, this is not legal, and you have to push back? <laughs> well, people come to us with different ideas, as you mentioned, and it's our job to explain those ideas to them and then figure out the best way to do it. One one question I get asked, which is not in that same uh, on that same topic, would be, is it better to lease or buy my new vehicle? And that's also something that you need to think about. Uh, I mean, if you think out of the tax world there, if you like changing your vehicles every two, three years, probably leasing is probably a better option for you. Um, but if you like keeping them for a longer time, maybe buying is a better option, especially if you can take advantage of, of the credit. And yeah, there's some non-tax reasons, there's some tax reasons, and also business use of the vehicles. So you need to be, you need to have proof of your business usage and your expenses. That's the bottom line. Item number three, tax considerations for tax year 2024, if you're changing jobs. So if you're a resident moving to fellowship, if you're a fellow moving to attending hood, um, or if you're changing employers mid-year sometime, you want to understand the implications in terms of W-2 reporting and payroll and tax withholdings, as well as retirement plan contributions. And this gets, especially in the tax side, uh, a little confusing. Evgeny, do you want to take a stab at explaining the the challenge with withholdings between two employers and how that potentially presents issues? So the challenges come usually not from the income tax withholding. They will withhold what you tell them to. So if you're changing jobs, you fill up your W-4, uh, read through the rules, make sure you account for all your family income at that point. 
so the income tax withholdings can be correct. And you can always add additional withholding. There's a line at the bottom that says, do you want anything additional, which is not included in your you know, base calculation. That's an option. So that's usually taken care of. The issue comes from Medicare. Oh, Social Security, I'm sorry, pardon me. Uh, Social Security, because there's a limit for the year. You pay taxes on your earned income, your wages at 6.2% up to a certain amount. And that amount also changes every year. I think it's 160, 200 in 23, and it goes up. I forget the amount, but those you can easily research and your payroll department should know that. Now, what happens when you change jobs well, the new employer doesn't know what happened in the previous employer. So they start from the bottom from zero and they will withhold, assume that you reach the maximum or exceed the maximum amount, they will withhold the maximum amount. And it's not a big deal. This this case is not a big deal. When you submit the two W-2s to your CPA, they enter the data, software will treat the amount the excess amount as a as an overpayment so you can either get a refund or get it applied to whatever you choose to do that's easy the issue comes and it this isn't rare but i've seen it happen when you have one employer and there is a glitch in their system and for some reason they don't stop withholding and in that case you cannot correct it on the tax return you can either go back to the employer and they can correct it, they can refuse, then there's a form that you need to file with the IRS to receive the money back. But that's a more difficult process, more laborsome, and probably will take longer. So hopefully it doesn't, and I don't think you can control it unless you notice it. So pay attention to your paycheck. Once you reach the maximum amount, the, those withholdings should stop. Mm-hmm. if they don't contact the employer. And with the 401ks, if we if I want to switch topic, there is a limit on the employee deferral. As uh, Justin mentioned earlier, 24,000 in 2024, that limit applies to you as a taxpayer. If you switch jobs and for some reason, you're allowed right away to defer on your new job. I know some employers have uh, rules when you can start deferring. Uh, let's assume you're allowed to defer. You need to add the previous employer deferral to that limit. If you don't, you're going to go over the limit, and there's tax implications regarding that. So that's something to uh, be careful about. You can always take it back, of course, up mm-hmm. to a certain date. And if you don't, it just becomes taxable. There's no rules like that on the employer limit, so your employers can contribute as much as they want. Uh, but employee deferral, there's limits. One other thing to be aware of, especially if you're moving towards a government role or within the, a government role, the TSP, the Thrift Savings Plan, is essentially the 401k of the governmental world with the similar limits and tax functionality. The TSP has a different time frame in terms of distributing excess contributions. So if you move from one job to another with a 401k, you have until April 15th of the following year. If you did, you know, 15,000 with your first employer and then another 15,000 with your second employer and neither employer knew to cap you at the annual limit and you over contribute, you can distribute the excess up until the tax deadline. You pay taxes on it like it's ordinary income, not a big deal. With the TSP, especially if you're doing your tax return a little closer to the deadline. Uh, You have to distribute the excess by March 15th, which is really annoying um, because sometimes you don't realize until after that. And then there's, you know, penalties and fees associated. And sometimes it takes a little while to process that document, the, the corrective document you need to submit in my experience. So if you're doing a TSP in particular and switching jobs to either in between like VAs or government roles, or in from some sort of non-government into the government, make sure that you're closely paying attention to your TSP max contribution. You don't want to over-contribute on the TSP and then be uh, stuck realizing too late that you can't distribute the excess. The fourth and final item in terms of 2024 tax planning and um, 
again, I'm sure you've seen this too frequently. You know, it's it's no secret. It's uh, something that's kind of common, <laughs> common to chat about in the uh, the ORs. Is uh, uh oh backdoor Roth IRA or mega backdoor Roth IRA or sorry mega backdoor Roth contributions, which is within a 401k plan. Um, this is something that is uh, you know it's kind of that jargony thing that everyone feels like they should be doing. I I can uh, tell you that there is a lot of people that reach out to me saying, hey, Justin, I think I should be doing the back to Roth. And they don't really know what it is or what it gets them, but they have this sense of everyone's talking about this thing and I should do it because everyone else is doing it, um, which is great and fine. And we should do it if you can, but you got to watch out for the potholes related to this. And specifically, you've got to have no other funded IRA. Um, whenever you have another IRA that has money in it, and a, a traditional IRA specifically. So this is would be a traditional IRA, a SEP IRA, a simple IRA. Those would all be types of IRAs that if you have money in it at the end of the year, you can't do a backdoor Roth contribution. Because whenever you go to do the conversion, a backdoor Roth, for those of you that don't know, is a two-step process. You put money into a traditional Roth IRA, sorry, <laughs> a traditional IRA, and then convert it to a Roth IRA in a non-taxable conversion. The reason it's non-taxable is because the contribution has basis, meaning none of the basis amount is going to be taxable, only that which is in excess of basis. So if you put a $6,000 amount into a traditional IRA and you're making attending physician money and you're contributing to a, an attending employer 401k plan, then you have a contribution with basis in your traditional IRA. You convert it into a Roth and a non-taxable transaction where it's essentially a two-step process that has been validated by the IRS as a um, legal workaround to the income limits that normally would preclude you from putting money directly into a Roth IRA. And this is a great way to build up tax-free assets so that you can do six or seven or $8,000 a year, depending on how old you are and what year it is. Every year, let that compound grow and work for you so that by the time you're uh, old and infirm, you've got a bunch of tax-free money you can access if you need to. Here's here's what we're saying today, though, is you've got to have no money in a traditional IRA as of the end of the year. So if you're thinking about this, it's January right now, and you tried to do the backdoor Roth last year, and you did the conversion, and at the end of the year, there is money in a traditional IRA of some sort, be it SEP, regular traditional, or simple, then you're going to have a taxable distribution and it's not going to work the way that you want it to and it's going to get all messed up. So this is an opportunity, especially for newer in practice attendings or residents and fellows. You can convert the entirety of your traditional IRA if you have it or you can roll it into an employer plan into a 401k to sort of clear the runway because when you're doing your tax return, there's this thing, the infamous form 8606. I know Evgeny knows these forwards and backwards and has done a bunch of them over the years. And I have seen many an erroneous 8606 from CPAs that uh, frankly don't understand this stuff, don't do a lot of backdoor Roths, don't work with many in the physician community where it's commonplace. And as a result on the 8606, you need to report what was the traditional IRA balance at the end of the year. And then there's what the a pro rata calculation that will determine, well, if you've got 10,000 in a traditional IRA and then you contribute 6,000 on top of that, and then you convert 6,000, uh, you're converting $6,000, but that 6,000 is muddied because it's got some basis and some non-basis dollars in it, which creates a taxable event. So bottom line is for 2024, first of all, when you're doing your 8606 for last year, uh, or when your CPA is doing it for tax year 2023 here in the coming days, make sure that that's properly reported, that if you have any traditional IRA basis, that that is noted, um, or pre-existing dollars that would not have basis that that is noted. And then for tax year 2024, if you've got this money, you can consider rolling it into an employer plan in order to not have the pro rata rule problem in the future. So what I, what I can add to this is this form so I would give more credit to my fellow CPA colleagues here. <laughs> a lot of them don't actually pay attention. It's it's prepared with the return. If they don't put the time to look into it, make sure it's properly prepared. It's it. I mean, it could be. Maybe they get lucky. It could be, or it's just some, there's something not right there. And also, even if you follow all the rules, you make your 
backdoor Roth conversions, you receive all your 1099s or 1098s, anything there, make sure you tell your CPA. And in addition, when the return is prepared, look at it. Look if it says if any of the conversion is tax-free or taxable. Uh, sometimes when it's not explicit on the forms when they come, it doesn't say this is a backdoor Roth IRA. So the code usually is two, which says there's some exemptions. It's taxable with exemptions, but I've also seen the forms with other codes. And if you don't tell your CPA and you don't review your work, it can be treated as a taxable IRA distribution, which at that point, if you're younger, it will even be probably subject to uh, excise taxes, penalties for early withdrawal. And you did all your work, it, everything was properly done, converted, and at the end, the tax return was overlooked and you're paying taxes on it. So pay attention to your tax returns. If you do a backdoor Roth IRA, confirm that it's treated as non-taxable. In addition to oh, sorry, what yeah. Justin said, that you shouldn't have any other IRAs mm -hmm. with value, regular IRAs. And you can just look at line four on your 1040 if you're like, you're throwing a lot of numbers at me, Justin and Evgeny. I, I get it that you guys know these forms, but I don't know what to do about all this. Just look at the first page of your 1040, line four. There's two boxes, one for IRA distributions and one for the taxable amount of those distributions. If you're doing in a, a back to a Roth, you want to have the distribution and the amount of the Roth and the taxable amount be zero. So if the taxable amount in box 4B is something other than zero, then there's a taxable event happening related to your conversion. And you want to understand why and make sure that that's properly reported. I think that's it for today. That's about all the taxes we want to subject our listeners to. Evgeny? Yes, I agree. Yeah, All these tax topics, we need to be sensitive about the timing because they're complicated, they're boring, and people lose interest. So I agree with you, Justin. Thank you for your time, as always. And um, glad we have consensus on Bruce Willis. Look forward to doing this again before long. Yes, thank you. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.